hope that you enjoy. I just want to give a quick thanks to the Tier 5 channel members and patrons. Bob the Dragon, Data Magnet, Sergeant Puma, Cat Crab Lobster, and Duck Machine. Thank you very much for the support. It is much appreciated. Story number one. The Culling Pits, written by Harfus. You sent him to the pits. Get in line! Keta shuddered. He was sentenced to the culling pits. Every proper gold court had two punishments, prison for minor offenses and the culling pits for worse transgressions. Kator was a convicted murderer, killed his supervisor while that old bastard was on one of his drinking binges, never saw it coming. Now Kator didn't plan to be caught, but nobody really does. With punishments, you're usually sentenced to prison or the pits. But if one so desired, a prisoner could always choose to go to the pits. Hi. Just ignore it, Kator, thinks to himself. Hello. Go bother someone else, Kator mumbles. Whoever's behind him couldn't possibly hear. Hey. Kator whips around. What do you want? He is immediately met in the image of the strangest creature he's ever seen. A short creature, standing a portable six feet tall. This fleshy little being was quite fat. It has a patch of hair on the top of its head. The top part of its head was quite shiny, as if the hair was running to the back of its head. In all actuality, it was quite comical to look at. Immediately brightening Ketor's mood, Hi, I'm Gregor. Might I know your name? Ketor was stunned. Why should this little creature want to know his name? My name is Ketor. Ah, a typical bug name. Oh, I'm sorry. You're called the Gull, right? Little bastard! If Kator weren't so confident in his ability to survive one day, he'd kill him right there where he stands. Yes, Kator grunts out. So, um, do you know where to get a drink around here? I'm parched. Kator remains silent. The murmur of the other convicts keeps strong while the two are silent. I tell you, this cunning pit business is a pretty good deal. One day here instead of a couple years in prison... I must say your justice system is kind of backwards. Ketor chuckles, his mandibles clacking together. This little Gregor doesn't even know what he's in for. The gates open, and all the convicts begin filing through. They all enter a large chamber with several platforms raised high above. The convicts stare at each other questioningly. Ketor is sharp though. He flips open his wings and flies up to the highest platform. He can easily keep this platform killing any being who tries to contest his position. It is at that point that the gates below open, revealing today's punishment. A light brown substance flows from the gates. Those beings that could not fly are soon slain by the liquid. Ketor begins wondering what a Gregor is. Such a strange creature. He must do research as soon as the day is over as to what they are. Kator's carapace deflects a blow from behind as he unfolds his spined hands, impaling the forek behind him. Enjoy the volash, Kator says as he knocks the forek into the liquid below. Kator is lucky. He knows what the substance is. Volash, one of the deadliest poisons to our kind. Kator finds an entrance thrill in fighting off the smaller goal to the other aliens that desperately want his prime location. Maybe I should take up arena fighting. I've always enjoyed kidding. It is at this point that the Volish has risen to the level of the platforms, then stops rising. Those few that have not claimed platforms fly above or desperately try to cling to the greased ceilings. Either way, they will fail and certainly can't win a fight against him. He then hears a splash nearby his platform, accompanied by hysterical laughter. Gator turns around and cannot comprehend what he says. Hey, Getty! How can you survive the Volash, you... You... What are you? Volash? This is beer. Can you believe it? This is a punishment. The Gregor says, doing some kind of strange swirling motion with its arms that propel it through the Volash. What kind of crime could send this creature into the pits? Kator contemplates this as Gregor lands himself on the platform with Kator and tries to dry himself. Kator barely notices. The Gregor leans over the side and takes a sip of the vile poison as Kator works up the nerve to ask it. Uh, what crime put you here? 
Gagrol responds, Well, the question you asked earlier, I'm just a human. But the second question, uh, it was just a traffic ticket. Gator laughs. This human chose the pit. End of story. Story number two. Doing the math. Written by Echoing Cascade. Warlord Stryer was on his way to glorious conquest. His researchers had found a planet with primitive sentience in a garden world with low gravity. The strategy, if you could call it that, couldn't be simpler. Teleport near the small tribe, humiliate the locals into submission, and create a beachhead to plant large teleportation hubs to bring in an occupation force. He went through the files his lead researcher and second-in-command, Overseer Ixley, had provided to him. Given the proximity to the star, density of the planet core and atmospheric composition, they should be particularly susceptible to radiation and thermal weapons. Their gravity is around 0.15 standard correlation, and the planet is rich in resources. He repeated the findings again in his mind. Such luck was rare. Not only was the planet within teleportation range of his home world, but it was populated by harmless primitives, who Ixley assured him still used melee weapons as their weapon of choice. This is too easy, thought Warlord Stryer, and this bothered him. He was a seasoned enough commander to know that if a target looks too tempting, it's probably a trap. So, he invited his old friend, Overseer Ixkli, to go over the data one last time. Stryer was sipping his meal inside his personal quarters, Ixkli seated in front of him. He had finished drinking his food long ago. Sata, are you certain of the resources available? Ixkli, oh yes, no question. Only one probe sent from the homeworld made it to the planet's surface, but before the electromagnetic fields of the core could fry it, it sent out a ton of data. It's an extremely rich garden world. Stryer was a little concerned by the news that only one probe had made it. But then again, the amount of information a probe could acquire in a handful of minutes was phenomenal. Still, he wanted to be sure. Stryer, and the weapons are primitive. Ixley pressed a button on his chest, which showed an image of two bipedal creatures wielding swords and swinging them at each other. Ixley, pretty sure, yes. Stryer's body undulated with delight. Maybe he was worried for nothing after all. Stryer, will the fields that fried the probe be a problem for the troops, weapons, or vehicles? Ixley waved the pseudopod dismissively. Ixley, no problem. Our combat gear is shielded for such energies, and our bodies wouldn't even feel them. Stryer, very well. We attack in two hours. His ship got to maximum teleportation range of the planet. No need to get closer, even if they were primitive. We wouldn't want any more advanced species that may be nearby to intercept them before they claimed the planet, and he couldn't port from the home world. Not if he wanted to be credited with the conquest. Stryer checked his troops one last time. All was in order. His 400 troops would storm the local village, situated where the probe was being destroyed kill all who resisted, and force the survivors into slavery. Overseer Ixley had sent an armored vehicle with a fast-learning linguistic tool to frighten the locals and broadcast their impending doom. He hit the activation button, and the teleportation device sprung to life. Stryer, to victory! He, his troops, and second-in-command stepped through the portal. Stryer managed to take two steps before he stumbled his chest piece and gauntlet suddenly feeling much heavier than they should. No, his whole body was too heavy. He looked around to see his troops in a similar position. He glared at Overseer Ixley, accusation and rage evident. Ixley managed to look apologetic while he thumbed his chest piece to bring out the data. Ixley, here's the problem, someone moved a comma. Their gravity is 1.5 coalition standard. Silly me. Before he could order for anyone able to make aim to kill the fool, he heard a countdown from four, which reminded him that they were not alone on this planet. 
A large gathering of the planet's sentient stood looking at them holding swords, axes, bases, spears, staves, knives, daggers, and a few projectile-looking weapons. There was a large stage of some sort behind them, and when the countdown ended, those on stage began to sing. Here, our soldiers stand from all around the world, waiting in a line to hear the battle cry. All gathered here, victory is near. The sound will fill the hall, bringing power to us all. We alone are fighting for metal, that is true. We own the right to live the fight, we're all here for you. Now swear the blood upon your steel will never dry. Stand and fight together beneath the battle sky. They began to slowly make their way to him and his troops, but before the one-minute mark, they broke into a run. Ixley, by the Emperor, they are faster than the slip tanks. He then turned to the warlord Stryer. Ixley, what do we do? Stryer barely managed to lift his plasma rifle and fire a few shots at one of the oncoming creatures, to no effect. Stryer, we die. General Yuriko of the Terran Alliance was going over the college. She was being followed by the event organizer, Dorian Moore. Yuriko, so let me get this straight. A weird-looking drone flew over the Hema into colonial tournament grounds. Someone shot it down by throwing an axe, of all things, and it fell into a pool which short-circuited it. Moore, yep. No one paid it any mind until a few days later when the world's ugliest Roomba appeared from the portal and talked of invasion and slavery. Here it go. At which points everyone grabbed the closest weapon that they could and prepared for battle? Moore. Well, uh, they claimed they were going to attack within the next half an hour. We tried to contact authorities, but since we're also running the classical metal concert, they assumed someone had taken too many drugs. Eureka. Any casualties? Well, they used what can be best described as BB guns that fired lit matchsticks. Their bodies have the consistencies of taffy, and they wear styrofoam for armor. Now, we barely got more than a first degree burns. Yuriko nodded and looked at the remains of the aliens. It had been cleaved from shoulder to hip, or their equivalent, with what was probably a long sword. Yuriko, any of them make it? Burr smiled. Well, we kept a few, though one of them in fancy armor keeps trying to kill another for some reason. Yuriko looked at the tech the aliens had brought with them. If the engineers were right, this was teleportation gear far beyond what they could dream. Moore pondered for a moment. Well, all in all, they got quite lucky. Yuriko stepped in the remains of an alien whose head had a close encounter with a mace kind and raised an eyebrow. Yuriko. Really? Yep. Tomorrow was Sabaton's turn to play, and a crap ton of poles are scheduled to show up. Yuriko. Oof. Yeah. End of story. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed, and 